Yes. So, well, seriously, what are we going to talk about? I don't know. Oh, geez. Knock it off. Do you want me to look at you? Do you want me to? Well, it's more. It, no, you don't look at the camera. You look at me. You can look at the. You can reference the audience, but this is a conversation. We're not going to do a two-camera two shoot. I wish three. Yeah. Okay. Unless you want to just talk to the camera no. yourself. Okay. I'm transfixed by your beauty. I would not be able to <laughs> concentrate if I look at you. However. Oh. Okay. I'd become one of your vassals. A minion. Yes. Hi, it's Dr. Natalie, and I'm here as a guest reporter for Ultra Live TV. And today I'm interviewing David Bloom um, from Words and Deeds. So, David, you're here at Digital Hollywood in Los Angeles. What are you doing here? Well, I'm. It's sort of like old home week here at uh, Digital Hollywood. I see a lot of folks that I know. I also am moderating a panel on connected TVs. And okay, now connected TVs. That's interesting. Aren't all TVs connected? I mean. They are connected to the uh, electrical grid, but now increasingly we are seeing uh, TVs that are connected to uh, the internet, to uh, the broader uh, world out there beyond just what broadcasting uh, and cable channels can send to a TV. So now we're seeing TVs with Facebook connectivity and Netflix connectivity built into the machine. And the information... So if I'm on Facebook, am I going to see myself on TV? Um, what you'll be able to do is actually access your Facebook um, site, your page, and do the things you would do there. What's interesting... Do I need a keyboard? You, you would need some way to interact with that TV, but you're able, uh, with the new kinds of control devices that we see, even uh, your iPhone or your iPad, I think would be an interesting tool, uh, to be able to input and use that as a remote control, a very sophisticated remote control for your TV. Um, most of the, the stuff that's coming in is movies off of Netflix or streaming in over the internet onto your TV so you can watch them, you can manage your account. That's going to change the whole ecosystem for the studios, yes? Absolutely, and that's why we're talking about it tomorrow. So, so what's the studio's point of view, do you think? Uh, I think it's one of uh, vast, unmitigated fear. Um, it's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, on the one hand, there's some new opportunities here. On the other hand, it is really whacking their um, uh, consumer goods uh, business known as DVD, which is already uh, flattened out and is now starting to contract. People other than with Avatar are not buying the DVDs they used to because they're getting things through Netflix streamed onto their, onto their TV. Whether so it's a new frontier and we're pioneers. Uh, once again, we're on the bleeding edge. <laughs> So I think, I mean, one of the themes that I see for social media is a lot of companies are really scared because this is a brand new world. They're not in control of the message. They're not in control of their brand. And so how do you think, what's the best way for companies to look at this? Is it Danger Will Robinson or is it the opportunity of a lifetime? I think it's both. I mean, I think that that's the, the, the fundamentally frightening thing is on the one hand, you get a chance to send your message out directly to your consumers, to your best champions of your brand. You get to in... Uh, if in you have brand. advocates, well, you have to cultivate them. You cannot Absolutely. assume. You have to create your advocates. You have to find them. You have to uh, cultivate them. You have to hold them close to your breast. But you also have a conversation going on, a horizontal, two-way, multi-way conversation. Two-way conversations and corporations? Yeah. A bit of a juxtaposition or oxymoron? or it's, it's not an oxymoron, but it is not the way they are built, and it's why they're challenged, because they're used to sending it out and letting it live out there in the world, sending their message out. Uh, they don't control the message, but they if they don't take part in the conversation, they're doomed. Well, I was just talking to my um, cohort. I think she's my cohort, Melissa Robinson. We were talking about this new university um, that's actually changing the way that they're going to organize themselves. Instead of functional departments, they're going to have a mission or a vision. And so at Weber Sham, we... No, it's okay. Sorry. Someone just got so excited they wanted to talk to us. Some people just want to be famous. <laughs> Somebody just, they'll do anything to get on camera. So at Weber Shamwick, what we do is we really look at org change. And one of the things we're finding is that social media really means that you're going to have to change the way you do business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies are resisting that. Right. Well, th they've got a, a structure that worked for them for 15, 20, 50, 100 years. And now they're being forced in many, many ways to, to break up hierarchies. I mean, we're seeing that in particular with the, the, the millennial generation kids who are just coming into the workforce. The oldest of those kids are like 26, 27 years old. You know, they think nothing about sending an email to the CEO. <laughs> or blogging. Or blogging about their work. Saying anything they want. Connecting in one way or another. And they don't really have uh, the same notion of 
the, the, the right order of things that people are used to. And, and that has, again, it has opportunities and it has threats to traditional organizations. Um, giving away control of your message so that you allow people throughout the organization to blog on your behalf is a fundamentally scary thing for a corporate communications operation. Yet they've got to figure out how they take advantage of the authentic voices in their organization. They have authentic voices? They can have authentic voices. <laughs> it is possible. I know, I'm a, being a bit of a contrarian, but I just read the book, The Machine That Changed the World, and it's really a recount of the American auto industry. And having grown up in Detroit, my dad worked for Ford, I worked for General Motors, um, what I found really interesting was that when I read the book, Henry Ford wanted to control everything. So he made a steel plant, a glass plant. Right. So vertical he, integration. Vertical integration, right. And so then we looked at what Toyota did, which was very different mm -hmm. in terms of being like a supply chain right. manufacturer. Right. Just in time. Just in time. And that was, that was really interesting. And so now we're seeing a restructuring of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to Frederick Taylor, do you know about him, Scientific Method? Sure. So he was at Bethlehem Steel. I think that was a steel mill. And he actually did a time and motion study of the guys who were shoveling coal. Right. And he optimized the size of the shovel and, and you know, exactly how you bend your knees and all that kind of stuff. So we've come from a very, very structured world to ultimately chaos. Right. Well, and chaos is kind of going to be where we're going to be in the future. I think the way we, we make progress in the future is how we channel the chaos into useful directions to so that everybody's kind of moving the direction we want them to move. We're going to have ad hoc uh, structures and hierarchies that come out of nothing. It's more like a Hollywood model of businesses where you, know, you have a bunch of uh, sole proprietors and small businesses that come together to make a hundred million dollar brand, i.e. a movie, right. and then they they, after two years, they, they break apart and move on to the next thing. I mean, I did that when I was at Hughes Electronics. We worked on a lot of different programs, F-15, AVAB, uh, Harrier Jet. And so we'd create a matrixed organization sure. where you'd have a homeroom, but then you'd go and work on a project. And then when the project was done, then you'd go and do something else. Right. It was it was actually, Peter Powell was our program manager, and he fashioned it after Hollywood because he thought that was the most efficient way to be able to get to the best people on a program. Absolutely. It, it keeps the overhead potentially down. So you're using the, the exact resources you need when you need them and not when you don't. Now, for to do that within a large organization like Hughes becomes a management challenge because you don't want to lose the talent, but you've got to find ways to keep them engaged on specific projects and move them around. And, and you've got to deal with issues of like, everybody wants that guy because he's really good. Uh, the cherry picking story, yes. Cherry we used to have that. Yeah. So back to digital hollywood here we are and we're facing these huge challenges and tomorrow you're moderating this panel so you guys need to tune in and see his panel you have a really interesting background i mean you've been a reporter and a journalist for years like can you tell us a couple of places well i worked uh, at a bunch of daily newspapers the last one was here in los angeles but also in memphis and amarillo and dallas and out in riverside i i worked at variety and the the, the long gone much beloved uh, red herring technology magazine and then I got an opportunity to go work as a vice president over at MGM uh, during a particularly interesting time and a very interesting company's existence. Uh, and then I was at USC in academia and at the business school and saw um, the challenges that schools are facing trying to educate kids to make their way in the business world as it's evolving right now. Well, I would think the education and the MBA programs would be a really good place to kind of talk about the change that we're seeing. Um, I talked to Bob Foster at UCLA, so hopefully Bob will hire me. Um, I'll send him this video. Um, but I think it's really interesting to think about how do we really change the mindset. So you have the people who've been in charge forever, and then you have the new uh, youngsters coming up who have a completely different framework. Right. I mean, really, when they look at technology, they just want to change the world, and right. they're not as revenue-driven. Right. And then you have the command and control structure that really is revenue-driven. So how, how are we going to make this all meet? I mean, you're talking about the connected TV. You're talking about me being on Facebook, on TV. Mm -hmm. um, why would I want that? Uh, you may not, but somebody who's 22 might. I know that you're an old 